that I need to switch, so I'm going to switch out. Alrighty. Aloha, ladies and gentlemen. Can you guys hear me okay? Wonderful. Welcome. So, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Has anybody been to the Maui Ocean Center before? Lots of hands. Wonderful. Give yourself a pat on the back. Thank you for coming back. Well, my name is Jessica. I'm the Education Director here at the Maui Ocean Center. And on behalf of all of the Maui Ocean Center staff, we thank you guys so much for joining us today. I don't know if you guys know this, but this is the first Sea Talk, not only of 2023, but of uh, reopening post-COVID. This is the very first one since reopening. So give yourself a big round of applause. We are so, so excited to be uh, hosting these programs with you. Um, and I know, know without a doubt that this will be uh, a really wonderful way to, to start our year. Um, this is also Maui Ocean Center's first ever hybrid style uh, presentation. Um, so we're actually going to be recording this and posting it for you folks. So I know a couple of you guys have mentioned like wanting to be able to write down the information, but we're going to do you one better. And we're actually going to be recording this and posting it for you guys afterwards. So you'll have access to Ed's entire presentation um, and it'll be uh, live streaming. So Ed, you actually have uh, some viewers uh, hanging out in their own home today, which is very exciting. Um, so big thank you to our audiovisual team and our Sphere team for making the marine education content even more accessible in our community. So if we could get a little round of applause for Marcus back there. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for making this more accessible to our community. All righty. I know a couple of you guys have uh, been in the room and heard some of these announcements already, but just a few details about the program before we get started into the official presentation. Uh, first and foremost, the presentation will be about an hour long, so from 6 to 7. So um, just kind of keep that in mind. If you do need to leave uh, before the presentation is over, I'm sure Ed won't take it personally. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but just make sure that you know that we have two emergency exit doors that are going to double as our main exits today. It's going to be one over on this side, which is where you all entered today. There's also another exit on the opposite side uh, directly across the sphere, um, which is the exit you'll use in order to access the restroom. So if anybody needs to use the bathroom today while we're uh, doing our presentation, make sure you guys come down this stairwell over here um, and and then excuse yourself, and it is accessible um, from the outside as well. So you can exit, go to the restroom, and then come right back in. We'll have staff members in the vicinity if you need direction to make your way back into the, into the sphere. Um, all righty. And without further ado, um, this evening I do have the distinct pleasure of introducing our guest speaker, Ed Lyman. It actually sounds like he has uh, introduced himself to some of you guys. We'll give a quick round of applause, and I'll introduce him. Wonderful. And he's had a lovely opportunity, I think, to chat with quite a few of you in the audience before we've gotten started. But just a little background on uh, Edward Lyman before we get started, in case you uh, aren't sure who you were talking to. Uh, Edward Lyman is currently the Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary's Natural Resource Specialist, as well as the Large Whale Entanglement Response Coordinator. Uh, he works closely with NOAA Fisheries under the Marine Mammal Health and Stranding Response Program and other various partners. And for 25 years, Lyman has worked with NOAA, state agencies, and others to better understand these animals and to address the threats and impacts against them, uh, especially ship strikes and marine debris entanglements. Lyman has a, uh, participated in over 120 disentanglements. It's hard to imagine, right? And over 40 of them were with the Humpback Sanctuary here on Maui. So without further ado, please help me in providing a very warm welcome to Doc, uh, Ed Lyman. Okay, thank you, Jessica, and aloha, everyone. It was quite an honor being here tonight, and going to be a pleasure. I, I've already been talking a uh, story with you guys, and that's exactly what I wanted to do tonight. I wanted to mix this up a little bit, do something a little different, not as formal as maybe some of the other talks I've done, but tell you some fish tales is what I wanted to do, because there's some analogies here. I, I'm trying to be clever. I caught one this big. I always tell the fishermen up in Alaska when I'm working up there, I got you beat, you know, I got bragging rights, right? Because there are similarities here to fishing. I'm going to make a few of those, but I do want to talk about something that is very dear to my heart, and as Jessica, you mentioned, 25 years, it's hard to believe, the gray hair. It catches up with us all, I think. But that is large whale entanglement, the threat, and the response. I didn't plan on this, it just happened, kind of fell into place. Tell you some stories over the years with a focus on our humpback whales here in Hawaii, you know, principal breeding cabin ground and um, 
and, and again, he, focus on humpback whales here in Hawaii and that threat. I'm gonna get my little pointer here, go on the next slide, because I'll give you a little background here, and this is the first comparison I wanna make with that threat um, and the response is one, well, it's a global threat. Many species are involved. It's not just gonna be humpback whales or whales in general. We are, again, gonna focus on the humpback whales, though. But it's that last slide. It can involve entanglement fishing gear, not always. I'm gonna point that out. Some folks have already noticed that we have that cable there that was entangled in a whale. It's not always fishing gear, but most cases it is. It's mostly what's out in the water there or the debris from fishing. Okay. So there's that analogy. Then the response itself is, I can make a comparison there to fishing because I think I put here catch, the catch I'm gonna get to release. You know, we have to catch the whales. They don't always know you're there to help them. They're very mobile, they're big animals, you know, humpback whales, 40, 45 feet long, around 40 tons of weight. And they can, they'll carry this gear thousands of miles over weeks, months, years. I'm gonna give you some examples of that a little later in the talk there. So there's some mobile whales there. So we need to catch them. There's one of the tools there, a grapple hook that grabs the gear, not the whale, okay? And then of course, what we're hoping to do is the release. So we have some of the knives here as well uh, that reach out on the end of long poles. These knives are sharp on the inside, dull on the outside for the most part, uh, so we don't harm the animal. So our release side. Now I jumped in, <laughs> what lies in between? is things like the Nantucket sleigh ride, okay? You, you might grab that whale, but it doesn't stop right away. And if you're in a small boat like this one, you're getting towed, so you're getting the Nantucket sleigh ride. So I'm making yet another comparison to fishing, because the old whaling, historically speaking, whaling in its heyday, you know, 1800s, that's fishing. I mean, that's, they were just fishing the whales. I mean, remember um, Moby Dick, you know, where the, I think that's the first page, he's just gone fish, you know, the great, the great fish, he calls the whale, right? So, um, the Nantucket Sleigh Ride. And so, our technique, simply put, is really a modification of an old, that old whaling technique called kegging. Okay, so this is the Gregory Peck version of Moby Dick. They gotta go back in time. They might still catch us on a Saturday afternoon, I think. But they're throwing a harpoon not to kill the whale, but to grab a hold of it. And then they get the Nantucket Sleigh Ride, kind of hokey, I know, but. And then what they had was a long knife on a, on a pole that they would lance the whale, bleed it out, okay? I'm gonna show you throughout the presentation tonight that the technique there, instead of the harpoon, it's gonna be that grapple hook, grabbing onto the entanglement. Instead of the wooden skiff, it'll be an inflatable. Instead of the wooden barrel that was used to keg the whale when it dove down, when it sounded, it will be a buoy. We'll actually add gear to get the gear off. We're gonna be very careful, gonna be very methodical, Okay, but we're gonna add gear, in many cases, not all, to get that gear off. And then, of course, our knives are not lances, but they're hooked knives, again, dull on the outside, sharp on the inside, on the end of long poles to release that whale. So there's, there's this, this simple comparison to be made. Now, during tonight's talk, I'm gonna give you a lot of video footage. It's gonna come from helmet cam footage, pole cam footage, to really put you there in the boat with us. And in this case, I wanna start giving you some background, because what allows us to actually rescue a whale that's that big, okay? And one thing is their size. They're so big that the impact is not immediate, okay? They're gonna, again, they can drag this gear, in many cases, not all, for thousands of miles and over long periods of time. So that size, see some of the footage here, is gonna buy them time, okay? Impact is not immediate, typically, okay? It buys them time, and that will buy us time, okay? That's, what's, that's variable number one. Okay, that allows us to do this, is their size and that time, okay? We, we always say we, be, we have to be very patient, okay? Now, I wanna give you some more background here because I mentioned that impact was not immediate, but the impact is still there. The risk factors are still there, okay? At the individual level, it is things like, well, lines cutting through flesh, and you, well, that's the tra uh, physical trauma, or it can be uh, cause a systemic or infection, whether systemic or otherwise. Uh, it can, uh, cause an associated risk factor, like you're dragging gear. Um, I know in nautical terms, you'll, you'll say the inability to maneuver, you know, the, your engine's down, okay? Well, whales, inability to maneuver, and they get hit by a boat. So it's an associated risk factor coming into play. There's also things like just being restricted in your mobility, you don't feed, so you starve to death, or you drown in the worst case scenario. So I wanted to go through those individual impacts for you, and then 
individual impacts can add to population level impacts. You know, if there's enough of them impacted, it can affect the population. For some whale species, by the way, that is indeed the case. If you've been reading the news back in the North Atlantic, those North Atlantic right whales, uh, there's not very many of them left. They're coming just a little over 300 animals, pretty scary number. So, but uh, at least at, at the population level, not overtly affecting our humpback whales here that will utilize Hawaii waters as that principal breeding calf and ground. I have a number up there, it's, it's dated, but it's the best number I have science-wise, 308,000 uh, whales, all whales, large and small, uh, falling victim to entanglement each and every year, okay? Again, it's, it's, you can see it's 2006 was the paper, Andrew Reed and others. Now, that is an underestimate. It was an under, underestimate years ago. It is indeed an underestimate still today, okay? It is a big threat, one of the big human cause threats out there. And again, for some species like those right whales, it's, it can be depressing the population. Okay. Other impacts, by the way, beyond the individual or right on that animal, is the ecological aspect, the, the network that's there affecting one animal. I'll show you a little later um, some fish feeding off of, off of our whales. Okay. Humpback whales here are feeding the ecosystem there a little bit. So I'm um, going to mention, got a little tickle from my lay here. <laughs> I was like, is there a bug? Um, there's socioeconomic impacts. So I'm, wanting, I'm painting the picture that there's a broad impact here, risk factor, okay? So socioeconomic, fishermen, uh, tourist industry. There's the cultural side, the significance of these animals to indigenous communities, whether here or up in Alaska. And then there's the response side. Uh, it could be us or it could be well-intentioned well -intentioned public hoping or trying to save the whale and they get hurt in the process, okay? So there's all these impacts. Okay. It, in the authorized response that I'm going to be describing to you guys, um, it is, well, it's not easy. You'll see that. You'll come to understand that. And it can be dangerous. We've had nothing, nothing major here in Hawaii, but it's kind of a global network, and we've had some fatalities. Uh, we had one uh, five or six years ago, a fisherman that was helping us, uh, got killed by a right whale in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So it is dangerous. Okay. That's Joe Howlett, by the way. And then the other variable I want to mention, number two, is the team, the expertise. It's not just me, by the way. There's a whole team there, and uh, we work together to, again, respond to these animals, and I'm going to point out, gain some information as well. So a nice team picture here, collage of some of the different teams. They're all trained and authorized. And then there's preparedness. I just mentioned training. So we do a lot of training. We, I brought some of the equipment that we have. We've developed these over the years. It's kind of evolved over the years. And we have incident command system, just like, I don't know, other emergency response teams, you know. So we have that structure. Oh, by the way, that's um, some, of our, some of our training images there. And we've made a, a training tail and a peduncle, and we can wrap it up and, and drag it behind another boat. And we practice cutting that mock whale free of its entanglement. So we do that each and every year before the season starts. Number four is the oversight. So what I'm, what, by the way, what I'm doing here is not only I'm giving you some background, but I'm acknowledging the different aspects in the team members here, because the oversight is going to bring in no fisheries. They have oversight of, over this. It's their um, Marine Mammal Health and Stranding Response Program, okay? It covers everything from strandings to entanglements to other aspects of, of animals, marine mammal, animals in distress. And then the sanctuary, the Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary, Jessica mentioned I work for, we have a regional oversight coordination working with NOAA fisheries. So that's where my role comes in with, with the expertise that I've gained over the years. Again, national program and in many ways global. So then I'm going to acknowledge another member of the team, and that's the on-water community. I was talking to Sed. He was, oh, he's sitting in the middle there. Yep. And just people that are out on the water, this is where it starts because people that are out in the water find that entangled whale and report it. Uh, basically, they are first responders. I mean, I'm, and by the way, I'm not saying go ahead and engage the whale, okay? I don't want you to do that. But calling it in, there's some cards up here, calling the hotline, giving us initial first re, uh, initial assessment, risk assessment, is definitely helpful, okay? So first response. And because, you know why that's so important? Because there are big needles in a big haystack, okay? An entangled whale, you know, yes, it's 45 feet long, but it's a big haystack. It's the Pacific Ocean. 
and so we need that help to find these animals, okay? So I tried to show a, a bunch of humpback whales there, and by the way, not one of, the, you know, there's no hidden entangled whale in the, in the fine wall, though, there, but, yep. Okay, I'm gonna give you not too much in the way of data, but I wanted to give you a background on, like, how has that community done? How many reports we've gotten? And if you look at these, I mean, those numbers, if you, those are the seasons right there. Okay, this is gonna work right along, well, maybe not. Okay, curved screen, it's a little tricky. But those are the case numbers over the years, over the seasons, and by themselves, those aren't that big. I can tell you, again, there, is more, there are more whales out there. We're just not finding them all. Okay, those are the ones we found different uh, cases or different animals entangled over the years. So the totals at the top, at least 168 animals, and those are the initial sightings. By the way, those are not where the whale got entangled. That's just where someone found it. You know, again, you know, I'll show you that sometimes they're coming from Alaska, okay? So, and now that gets to the point, okay, why respond? Okay, if it's dangerous, if it's hard to do, if it's, you're not finding them all, all those variables, that come into play that might allow us, but also challenge us. And the reason being is, well, there's a big positive feedback there. If we can respond, it's increasing awareness and promote stewardship, it's, it's gonna help the reporting and prevention side of things. Um, it's reducing risk across the board, not just for whales, but for fishermen. I, I can tell you, sometimes I've cut a whale free, tie all the lines back up, call the fishermen up and say, hey, your gear's all intact, it's there for you again, come get it, that kind of thing. Work with the overall community. Of course, the big one here is releasing some whales. We definitely like getting a whale free from a life-threatening entanglement, no doubt. So, and the last one's an important one, and that is the science behind this effort. We want to, you know, all those challenges, we're not gonna solve the problem by trying to cut every whale free. We don't find them all, we're not always successful. We've gotta figure out what the gear is, where it came from, what part of the gear they're getting entangled in, the science behind it. And that's going to take us towards, well, reducing the threat, mitigation in that regard. I'll give you some examples of that throughout the talk tonight, okay? But what I wanted to do, I gave you that background, I wanted to spend some time talking story with you. I want to tell some fish tales. It's going to take us through, focus primarily on our humpback whale efforts, cutting whales free here in Hawaii. Um, by the way, this is one of our early ones here that I'm showing you. This is, you'll see David Matilla here early on. He was a research coordinator and was the person that taught me much about cutting whales free. We'll show him once in a while. So um, I'm gonna, I put this slide up because this is one of our first whales here in Hawaii. And I remember the day when David Matilla enticed me to come to Hawaii from New England. I think it was like November, December. It was already cold. And I was like, yeah, I'll come. It, you know, didn't have to twist my arm that much. And I had been working on right whales, and right whales are very challenging with a lot of pressure. At the time, there was only a little over 300 at that time, like 20 years ago. And so there was all this pressure, every whale counts. And so I was kind of happy to go to Hawaii, work on humpback whales. And I will tell you right now that yes, it's paradise. It's warm water, clear and all that. But I said it was breeding calving grounds here. So the males are kind of pumped up on testosterone. The females are very protective of their calves. So guess what? It wasn't, it wasn't all, I don't know, totally paradise. There were some challenges there in working and cutting whales free here in Hawaii. I'm gonna give you some case histories here. This one is, takes us back in 2015. It's a female, dot humpback whale, had five wraps around her tail, okay? And she was off the big island. I'll show you some telemetry on this, but. As I mentioned, this was a case where we could, we had to keg her. We had to grapple her, the trailing gear, add some buoys, get her slowed down, and then we could pull up right behind her like you're seeing here and start reaching out and making the cuts. I'm gonna show you some pole cam footage of making those cuts. I'm gonna show you two of the three. Here's one of them. It's gonna be a fixed knife. I'm gonna explain a little bit here in the process. Pretty big ropes there around her tail. That knife stayed on the pole. We call it a fixed knife, okay? Then the second cut here, flying knife comes off the pole, okay? Because it's gonna grab more than one wrap. So grab two wraps, not gonna cut right away. So you release it, there's a line attached, you get out of there. You don't wanna be sitting next to the whale trying to make the cut, okay? So, and then of course, that worked. We made three cuts, all the gear came off, and those kegging buoys, those poly balls that we use, those are our kegs. Basically, not only did they slow the whale down and keep it at the surface, but once all the gear is free, they keep it from sinking to the ocean floor and let you get it out of the ocean 
and let you do the science on it, let you figure out what you got your hands on, got off the whale. So that's an image of that. Okay, I'm going to give you a different case here. This is just what, five years ago. This is a juvenile, I believe, uh, male humpback whale. This is off Maui as well. Uh, mouth entanglement, it had braided line. Okay, the other one was three strand, pretty big. This one's a little smaller, th was braided. Okay, there's reasons I'm telling you this, by the way. Here we are towing behind that whale. We've already grabbed it. We've actually made some cuts already, and we're working our way up, trying to make more cuts. You'll see me untwisting. It's all twisted up. So I'm going to see if we can pull it from the whale's mouth. We actually get a little bit, and then it starts to fight us. Okay, I don't know if it clamped down on the gear. So we didn't, we didn't get it all off that day. We got most of it. Okay. And then it started doing this. Okay, it started fighting us, started thrashing around, started almost pulling us into the, to the tail. So we had to stand down for the day. We, good news, we finished it the next day. Okay, I'll show you that momentarily. Okay, now I'll give you one more case here in this grouping. This is another braided line, okay? And this one had the pot hanging underneath of it. This had a Dungeness crab pot, about 100 feet hanging below the tail, like that pot you see up there, okay? Trap, pot or trap. Another name for pot or trap. And then here in the buoy that we got off the, off the whale, so, you know, sometimes there's numbers on the buoys, if it's fishing gear, that will tell you what it is, right? Okay, in this case, um, the buoy was damaged, the numbers weren't readable, but it had a little chip there, right? that little nickel-sized chip there, see if this is gonna work, there it is, was in the buoy, and um, this is Canadian gear, all the braid lines were Canadian, the other three strand lines were Alaskan gear, so two things, these whales, all the ones I just showed you, they dragged it from feeding grounds, from high latitude feeding grounds, which are, for most part for us, Alaska and the northern part of British Columbia. And that last one had this chip that when I sent it back to Canada and they scanned it, they told me everything. They said the whale got caught in the northeast corner of Queen Charlotte Island, uh, that kind of thing. I know, and the fisherman lost his gear and such and such a date. So really a wealth of information. So it's another example of technology, okay? But all those were coming from high latitude feeding grounds. So those red lines are from high to low to us. Those are all real, I didn't just draw some lines there. Sometimes I know exactly where the gear came from, like Wrangell, Alaska, or Shrimp Pot. We've had two come from Unamak Pass. One was pot gear from west of the Pribilof Islands in the middle of the Bering Sea. So like 2,300, almost 2,300 nautical miles, straight line distance. That is a testament to the strength of the animals and a testament to the challenges of trying to figure out what it is. It tells you the whales can carry this stuff from across worlds, across the ocean. So you gotta be careful. Don't make the assumption that it came from, you know, in your region, for instance. Okay. Here's a, a, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit, take you to show you some different types of gear. Those, by the way, were all pot gear, trap gear, crab for the most part. This is a long line, it's monofilament small diameter, and I also want to make a point that there's different impacts on the gear. That gear that I, the pot gear that was big, okay, you know, maybe that big in diameter, that has less impact, at least in the short term, because it acts like its own chafe gear. It doesn't cut into the whale as readily. That monofilament's still strong enough, and so small in diameter, it is nasty for the whales. It slices into them very quickly, um, by the way, we will not keg a whale with this type of gear, so we're not going to pull on this. I'll show you what we do. Okay, okay here, well, here's showing you what we did with this whale driving up. Um, it's a yearling, small humpback whale, and we're going to hook around the tail, almost bit off more than I could chew. Um, so it would have been embarrassing if I lost the pole, but luckily it cut. So we got a lot off, and uh, that's cutting on the fly, so we can't keg. We're cutting on the fly. We're gonna motor up to the whale and see if we can get a hold of it, okay? Okay, here's some follow-up cuts. I just, I can't show you all the cuts, but we made like five or six of them. So there's the whale at the bow, boom, right there's the cut. Three lines cut right then. I'm, see if I did the, okay, sometimes I show you a, a still or a, a frame grab, but it was three cuts right there. Eventually, we got all the gear off that yearling humpback whale. Here's a calf. This is a really sad because the little guy's only been around maybe a week or two and already is entangled, so it does happen. Um, so this is a, a humpback whale calf here in Hawaii back in 2013. Had a wrap. Um, in the end, we didn't know what it, well, in the end we found out what it was. It was monofilament, okay, that's wrapped around the body. 
Um, it was not cutting into the little guy. We didn't know that at first, but we found out. So happy ending here, by the way. Um, it's just pinched in because remember, mothers are feeding these calves very rich milk. We're talking like almost 50% milk fat. And if you need perspective, vitamin D whole milk is 4% milk fat. It's very rich. They grow very quickly. So we made attempts at cutting this well free off of Lahaina. Okay, we spent a whole day, and our knives, like I said, are dull on the outside. It was about every, any opportunity we had, it was just hopping right over that line. We weren't getting in. We needed to get in, and we couldn't get the wrap, so we, we failed the first day. We got another opportunity a couple days later, and in the interim, one of the team, Grant Thompson, made a new knife. He did, I call it the Thompson Blade. His last name's Thompson. Uh, it's a bamboo knife. We tend to go to Ace and True Value a lot, I think, and um, and uh, they know me, and uh, so it's a bamboo knife. We just he just carved it and made it sharp on both sides because we were like we have to cut the little guy to get to that wrap, and it's lethal. We think it'll kill the calf if we don't cut it. So I'm going to show you that. So we got the new knife. A couple days later, tour boat finds the whale. Um, we're in a good scenario here. The two males had left. Only mom is there with the calf. Mom is resting at depth. So we're just going to do this like when the calf comes up, we, we just put the boat in gear and get a little closer. And every time the calf came up, every three to five minutes the calf came up, we would bump the boat a little closer. Eventually, we got close enough, and I think it just played where we made that cut. I mean, it took like an hour and a half, but there was the cut. I think I show you. There is the, someone took a picture right at that moment. So we did really well. We left almost no little cut on the little calf. Um, and we did a good job. And, and one frame of that camera that I put on the pole showed the monofilament exploding off the calf. So we didn't find out what it was. Did we collect it? No. But we at least saw what it was. Okay. I'm going to show you another case here. This is a... Um, a sub-adult, I think it was about three years old, a male off of Oahu, so I'm, I'm showing you different islands. But I, have you figured out, I'm starting to show you not only different gear types. This, by the way, was local pot gear. This is crab, Kona crab, off of Oahu, okay? So I'm showing you different gear, but all the animals I just showed you were youngsters. The, the yearling, the calf, the sub-adult, the juvenile. Okay, so there's another theme here. Okay, this one, we got a hold of it, and as we pulled up, tilted its flipper up, and that, that's what was entangled. So it gave us this opportunity to cut it free, and we took it, okay? And so that's, that's us cutting it free. I'm going to admit to you that I cherry-picked a little bit. I got a blooper to show you, okay? Okay, and that is the second clip, because the first time I did this, just as I reached out to make the cuts on the flipper, the whale put it back down the water. And so I was blind. I, I was, like, guessing, and I'm wearing a helmet cam footage, or I'm wearing, wearing a helmet cam, and on the footage... You can hear me going, two cuts, I think. Well, guess what? Here we sh we'll see it. Okay, th there's me trying. Let's see. Yep. And oops. Can you guys hear that? That is either ouch in humpback whale or something worse. Okay. So, so I missed. And it's, it's kind of minor for the whale. That happens once in a while. Um, it, really, the worry here is the... Is the response of the animal to the response team, you know, could it, would it respond negatively? So the second cut, we got it free, okay, and, and it was totally free at that point. So there's, here's some science, some, some uh, data showing you the percentages that we've cut free of adults, sub-adults, and the calves, not very many calves, that makes sense, they're brand new, but those, that pie, the portion of the pie for the sub-adults, that's much larger than population. So it's telling us that a lot of youngsters, probably lack of experience, all that coming into play that are getting entangled. So um, give you a little data there. I want to briefly show you some of the other, mention some of the other gear types. I did say it wasn't always fishing gear, so I've got moorings, cables. We have that up here on the table here. Uh, so communication type cable, anchor roads, that's the anchor chain and line from a boat. Um, and FADS stands for fish aggregating device. Yes, it's associated fishing, but not directly fishing gear. It's a putting debris in the water to, to make an ecosystem that draws little fish and little fish draw in big fish. So that's what a fad is. So, And then um, I wanted to point out some changes in some of the gear types we've noticed over time. 
uh, especially, you know, a couple years ago, we had some big environmental changes, the big heat wave in the Pacific Ocean, uh, the blob, there was a big El Nino, big uh, positive phase of the North, De uh, North Pacific Decadal Oscillation. It put a lot of warm water that is not as productive, and so not as much food, and the humpback whales responded as such. And so we saw things like, well, we were getting more Alaska gear down here than BC gear, British Columbia. But during the heat wave, we got much more British Columbia gear coming down than Alaska gear. It switched. We got more nearshore gear, gear that would be like things like anchors and cables and outhauls, things you'd put your little skiff from off from shore. Okay? We were getting whales caught in things set very close to shore. They were feeding close to shore on different food items because of that marine heat wave, things like that. So we're, we're making tie-ins with climate change. And it shows how climate change can affect another risk. So, um, and by the way, fewer subadults came down here. We think actually they just weren't coming. They're smaller, fuel tank is not as big, and they weren't making it down or they weren't trying. They were just staying up in the feeding grounds. So things like that. This is um, a subadult, by the way, and, I, and this is the cable entangled whale. I'm going to actually tell you a little bit more about this. It was 850 feet of cable trailing behind that whale. It was in the mouth. Uh, you can see it there. Uh, poor guy. It looked like he got it locally. He's not that bad off. So he got it close to here. Here's us cutting it free the next day. One cut. So it's, and we had to go to Ace and get the uh, cable cutters. Yeah, we didn't that, have them in that, the kit. I now have cable cutters in the kit. Okay. So, so there's the two cuts. We left about, what, 35, 45 feet of cable in the whale's mouth. We couldn't get it out. So at least we helped. Okay. Uh, there's me holding up the cable. It's off Charlie Young Beach. So the other thing was whales getting right into the swimmers, so we hurried up and made the cut. So, okay. Here's a yearling, so still showing you a lot of youngsters. Uh, this one's this year. We had a very productive season, unfortunately, I guess, in the sense that we had that many whales entangled to get them free, but um, had some uh, light line around the tail, um, dragging it, and he, he did not want to stop, by the way. Uh, ended up he was dragging a lot of weight, and he, did, he wanted to fly the weight, okay? So here's, I'm going to just jump right to one of the cuts, made two cuts, and there's the cut. It already happened. There's reaching out. It's a flying knife, so it's going to make the cut there. The cut's been made. So and that might be the last cut, and what happened was, as soon as that last cut was made, the poor guy that was holding the boat, holding that uh, whale, boy, as soon as that whale's free, he suddenly almost went overboard because of that weight. The whale had been carrying the weight, Suddenly he was carrying it, so he let go in time before he got pulled overboard. And what I'm showing you there on the inset image, that weight was someone's mooring or a fad. It was 10 70-pound brake rotors. That's what you're looking at there. Okay, we went down. Those are brake rotors from a wheel of a truck, big trucks, okay, like semis. Okay, so that's what, that's what that poor youngster, that yearling in that case, was trying to carry uh, from his tail, okay? And then so what I've done is, again, a little science here, is give you the breakdown of what we know. There's a whole portion of the pie I removed here, the unknowns, don't always know. But for what we know is it's everything and anything, okay? Some of that's fishing gear, some of it's not. You know, you got, I got some mooring and aquaculture, I've got fads, I got some, we've had a couple cases of whales getting caught in the scientist's hydrophones. You know, the underwater microphone that you put in the water to hear them sing? whale got entangled in it. So it can be anything and everything you put out in the water column. That's the message I want to give you. Okay. So uh, one thing that's missing there, if we go back real quick, is do you see that much net? No. Okay. If I go to Alaska, like one third of the, of the pie would be net, a gill net, trawl net, things like that. We just don't get much of that down here. And I think the netting is cryptic in the case of gill nets, so maybe we don't see it by this time. Uh, after going five weeks and traveling 2,000 miles, or it's, it can be lethal. And I think net that is, I don't know, rolled up or is mummifying the whale is lethal for the animals. They just don't even make it here if they're carrying it, okay? So that's my hypothesis, okay? Um, so that's, there's the one net entangled humpback whale that we've had in Hawaii, okay? Gene Lafferty, or Jason and Gene took that off the Big Island, okay? And then um, I want to get into some techniques here, and I'm going back. I, this is one of those ones I added. Oops, I must have hit the slide. There was a mistake. Okay. So this first technique 
is this takes us back when I started back on the East Coast. Um, we had some right whales entangled up in the Bay of Fundy, and they were flying us up to the Bay of Fundy to, to cut these whales free because there's only 320 of them left. And we had one that had three wraps of gillnet on it. You can see the three wraps there. The, the gillnets rolled up, and rolled up gillnets very dangerous, by the way. It's like Kevlar. It's really strong, hard to cut and everything. Um, what happened was the, we got the, the aft two wraps off, but the forwardmost wrap was tied to the flippers, and so every time the whale arched, the flippers go out, it was sawing. It, the action was causing that net to saw in. And by the time we got to it, it was already like eight inches deep into the body. Now, right whales are very blubber rich. I mean, lots of blubber. So it hadn't made it to the muscle yet or anything. But we made it a special knife, just like the Thompson blade, that was going to cut our way in. But we needed to get the whale to stop or slow down to make that cut. And so we were going to, we decided... We, would, we didn't want to pull on it and make that worse, make that last wound worse. So we were going to lasso the whale. Those are our designs to do it. And it almost worked. I was like, oh, this is going to be, you know, this is going to be embarrassing. And, but we made this big lasso. Um, we had whisker poles that would push the lasso off to the sides of the inflatable. One guy was going to push a whisker pole forward up on the peduncle of the whale. And we had the last part of the loop just lightly taped to the bow of the inflatable. So we pulled ourselves up behind the whale, and, and it, it came like inches away from basically getting over this big 17-foot-wide fluke. So we just missed it. By the way, this is a sad one. We did a hurricane came. We had to stand down, and, and it was our, she, by the way, she ended up dying and, and was found off Atlantic City. So that's one that got away from us. We tried. Okay, I'm going to take you back to Hawaii, though, and look through some more cases, but also give you techniques, because sometimes you get lucky, and sometimes you can just make a cut and pull the gear free. This is a whale from a couple years ago, and you can see how it's in the mouth and around the flipper and trailing aft. Let's show you after a cut is made. Here she is. Okay, and look at unraveling off the flipper. Okay, so success... But look at the condition of the whale, not in good shape. So I don't think this one probably made it just because we're too late in getting it free. Okay, but otherwise it was success. So pulling the gear off, here is that the continuation of the story of the one that was thrashing that I showed you earlier, that we had to stand down. The next day we found it resting, not moving, off of, kind of towards Molokini. And we just motored up. You can see me motoring there. I said, do not pull on the gear. Yesterday, this well got perturbed. Let's not pull on it. I'm going to motor and just, just gradually pull in the gear. Don't pull on it. Don't tug it. And so we did that. And what you're going to see is suddenly I saw one whale come up and I go, oh, that's round dorsal. That's not our whale. But then suddenly another whale breached next to the boat. And I was like, crap, that's the whale. Let go of the line. I'm like, let it go. Don't hold it. Because I think it was going to rip, right? And the guy doesn't let go. The guy at the bow helping me doesn't let go. I don't know if I added this. No, it doesn't show it here. But you'll see that he's... Oh. Okay, there it is. He's pulling it out. But this is what I want to show you. See if that'll play. Okay, good. Okay. This is from the support boat. That's the whale that's, that was entangled. But I don't know was yet. Um... So I'm like, let go, let go. And the guy at the bow is still pulling it up. And he goes, don't worry, Ed, it's okay. And then he shows me it, and I'm happy. Okay, so I'm holding my hands up. So then I'm going to show you this. Here's the moment he shows it to me. And he goes, and you can't hear the audio, but he goes, Ed, it just spit it out. I just, I looked down, the whale tilted its head up, and I just pulled it from the whale's mouth. So I was like, you could have told me that earlier. You know, I would appreciate it. <laughs> so happy ending there. Um, and sometimes they work with you. So some, I, I should admit, sometimes it does seem, people ask me all the time, do the whales know? And I have to admit, sometimes maybe, you know? Yep, so uh, here's a, a little rougher day here. Um, and I'm showing you the cutting on the fly again. This is long line, youngster. Are we gonna keg? No. So here, Jason Moore and Nicole Davis are gonna throw this cutting grapple behind that yearling and just clear off everything behind it. We can't pull on it. We can't. Tug, you know, we don't want to pull or keg on that. So we're just going to clear it all off. So we've got all that long line off. And this is where then you saw me reaching out with a pole and making additional cuts to remove the rest of the gear. Okay. There's a picture of the cutting grapple. Here's the mother from this whale from this year, this season, that's got a bunch of marine debris around her head. Nothing trailing. 
So here, she could have handled the kegging, but it's hard to get a hold of her. And if we're going to get a hold of that rap, it might as well be a knife. So we took six hours patiently tailing her and her calf and waiting for the golden moment that we could reach out. So I'm going to, I'm going to jump past six hours and show you that moment. Okay, well, first, a better view of her and her calf. Okay, there's the knife ready to go. Okay, and here comes the moment. After about, it was close to six hours. Okay, here it is. She's coming up. I'm going, oh, this is her moment. Lee James is going to hook the knife in. It's a flying knife. Okay, I'm going to clear the pole for him. He overtaped it, by the way, a little bit. He could have laid off on the tape there that was holding the line to the pole. Okay, and then look at him. He's just hold, he's letting the line out. Okay. And watch him move. There he goes. There's the cut. When he moves his elbows, oh, that was the cut, and she's free. So, so, and I don't think I showed it to you, but let's see. Nobody did it. But she started breaching, and the calf was breaching. It was, it was a happy ending. So, okay. Oh, and I should have shown you that one. Um, here, I'm introducing, uh, it's another sub-adult, I believe, but I'm, in, I'm introducing some technology here, okay? I'm going to also introduce the tools and techniques. And this one I didn't bring to show you. I keep it on the boat for the most part. But I, we've designed like an, instead of the endoscope, it's an exoscope. Um, and uh, basically, those cameras I've been putting on the end of the poles, I've been like, gosh, I wish I could, I could see that view live stream. So guess what? We put HDMI cable up the pole. I wear a, p a pair of glasses now. So I think that's what I'm doing here. We were making, putting all my gear on, it looked like RoboCop there. Um, but those glasses give me a view of the camera. So everything from the angle, I know a lot of my helmet cam footage, I would say, I'd be saying things like, am I far enough? When you're starting to reach 20 or 30 feet on a bouncing boat, it's hard to look down a pole. So now I don't have to worry. I, I, look, at the, I look at my little image in my glasses and I go, oh, I gotta go another two inches. I gotta turn my knife a little bit so I don't poke the whale, things like that. So it's kinda cool. So we're designing that. So here it is. Here's the first time I used it. It was the cable entangle whale, if you recognize it. I missed because the whale saw the knife coming. The eyeball and the mouth are right next to each other, okay? So it saw the knife coming when I went for it, and it was doing this. <laughs> and I ran out of pole. You know, I just I was like kept reaching, reaching, and I just ran out of pole. So I never got it. Good thing, because it wasn't going to cut anyway. It needed the cable cutters. So we're trying. And what I had to do here is I just threw a bunch of little tools in all on one side. Um, we've got, uh, those are the primary tools at the top. I remember that, that one where the whale saw my knife coming? I don't think this is going to work, but I went ahead and painted them up a little bit, dulled them and put blue and different shades of blue for a camo. We'll see if it works. But, um, and then there's this, a new one for those big heavy hawsers. And, oh, we used a lawn sickle for the gill net up in Alaska, and it works. You, sh you can sharpen a lawn sickle up really, like almost like the blade will feel like rubber. You peel that bead off, and it's super sharp. And I remember cutting a gill net off of a whale with the, with the lawn sickle. Um, that was true value. Uh, oh, this is, this is called the gobbler guillotine. We haven't used this here yet, but it's been used elsewhere. It's an arrow, broad, broad point arrow that you shoot from a crossbow that if you have a line you can't get to otherwise, like a wrap around the head that's tight, you, all you have to do is nick it with that arrow if you're a good shot. And then it'll just pop off, and it's, done, it's worked. I would never have believed the gobbler guillotine for cutting turkey heads off um, would have freed a whale, but it's cut a couple free. So I just want to give you some examples there. By the way, this is, this is our uh, Swiss Army knife of whale rescue. It can be modularized. You can take things off, put different heads on there and um, for different weights and different depths. So it's, and it's actually made in Switzerland, by the way, which is kind of cool. So I brought that as well, it's in the brown bag. So lots of tools. And then another piece of, well, another tool or a piece of technology is transmitters, telemetry. Uh, we use them primarily in case the whale fights us or if it's late in the day or it gets rough to give us another opportunity. We can, we can put the tag on and we can go find it the next day if the weather's good. Okay, so that's what that is right up there. Primarily satellite, VHF all wrapped up in the one. And it goes in that buoy, and you just attach that buoy on the gear entangling the whale. And then you can track it, okay? So it's a great tool to have. Uh, this is a, a track here. This is a whale was seen off the Big Island. Uh, this is a couple years ago. This is that female with the five wraps around the tail. And so she's seen 
Um, let's see if I can do it this way. Yeah, she's seen here, and she, then we don't know where she goes here, but next day she, she's recited, and she's the transmitter gets put on right here. And then she goes around the island, and we're waiting for her over here on Maui. So then she goes over, and boy, by this point, I went out to Molokini at the edge of the wind line, and I said, should, should arrive around 7 o'clock. So I had everyone with their antennas up ready, and she was right on the money. She came out of the wind line at 7 o'clock, and we started working on her. So it was kind of cool. So, so those tool, uh, the tools are great. Uh, by the way, that one is an old piece of technology. We designed that like 25, 30 years ago, uh, and it's got some drag to it. It can do harm to the animal. You're trying to weigh that out. So uh, Nature Conservancy, No Fisheries, and some engineers in California are helping us design a new lower drag, more visible, better, like instead of satellite technology, iridium or, or a different type of satellite technology. So it's a better tag for the animal and for us. And I'm, I'm showing it there, okay? So we're still in the testing phase, but so far so good, and tools make a difference. Okay, and then there's a suction cup tag. I did bring that and was mentioning this. This is more about trying to, things like for entanglement, the energetics, uh, the impact of the entanglement on the animal. But here I'm gonna show you putting it on a mother with her calf. So this is non-entangled uh, humpback whale, okay? So we put it on there, just you saw it, just kind of slapped on her. Not much of an impact there or any response. And then here is the footage. I wanted to show you, give you a sense of the cameras. This is mom with the calf out in front, okay? You know, what I noticed here was the calf rides mom's bow wave. And every once in a while, the calf would hit mom in the head with its tail or its body, and a bunch of skin would come off. So it was like the fish are following the calf, and it's almost as like, like it's like the, the family dog underneath the toddler's high chair, you know, during mealtime. You know, the dog is positioned perfectly, and I think these fish are doing the same thing because fish, you know, whales do feed the fish. They really do. The whales down here are adding productivity to our ecosystem, and this is a good example of that. So good, cool footage, and there's a, I did a frame grab showing you the, the fish actually eating the skin that has been knocked off mom. So, okay, a little aside I thought was interesting. So drones, another piece of technology that has really helped us. You know, we had our most productive season last season. Um, it's, okay, good. And um, this is drone footage. It's Christmas Day um, back in 2017. And so we flew the drone over, and what we learned was that that line was in the mouth, but it went straight through and, and ended there, okay? It didn't weave through the baleen. Remember, humpback whales are baleen whales. If it wove through the baleen, we cannot pull on it because if you pulled on it, you could damage the feeding apparatus of the whale. So it told us we could pull on it, and we just pulled the gear right from our mouth, because we, but we knew we could, okay? So I did that. And then I'm gonna bring the two together. I'm gonna tie them together. This hasn't been done yet, at least not here, but we're gonna tie the drones and the suction cups and the tools together, because it could be hard to get up next to a whale and throw a tool or put a suction cup tag on it. And certainly with the suction cups, I like the science, but cutting the whale free is more important, right? Okay, so the drones, are gonna let us drop those suction cups from the drones. So the whale's not even gonna know the drone's up there. I will get my science and get my whale free too, I think, I'm hoping. So we're gonna have, we have a project coming up in a couple weeks. We're gonna work with Ocean Alliance. They're an uh, uh, organization on the East Coast out of Boston, out of Gloucester, and they're gonna work with us and train us on how to use drones to not, again, drop those tags, but also they're gonna help me, they're gonna, they're designing uh, a lighter version of the grapple. A lighter version of this in here in this bag, there's a, gra a cutting grapple. They're, we're gonna design a, a lighter version of this. We can drop them and cut whales free remotely dr from drones. So uh, there's another good example of technology maybe helping us. So I wanna give a shout out to them and again, that effort's coming up. Now, last season was our most productive, okay? Uh, we've, we've almost, we're up to around 40 animals uh, that we've cut free, gotten gear off. That's our last cut, by the way, the last one last year. That you see me cutting it free. We had um, nine different cases. Uh, we engaged five of those. We were able to. I mean, many of them were late in the day, never saw them again. Got one report, and we never got even on the water to them. But five of them we engaged, and we got all five free. We got gear off of them, all five. One of them was that mother with its calf, so I kind of consider the calf being a 
benefiting as well, okay? And uh, nearly 3,500 feet of gear measurable off the whales last season. That's the most gear, the most rescues we've done in one season. It was kind of a big year last season, so 12 different efforts. Overall, 190 responses. Again, gear off 39 animals. Uh, added all up, again, measurable that I actually measure. Okay, I don't measure all the twine and netting. Uh, 15,000 feet of gear removed off the animals, so it's a lot of gear. And uh, we've identified at least 75 sets of gear. That's giving an example of the science again there. You know, figure out what it is, where it came from, things like that. Okay. Um, and I wanted to come back to this point. You know, when David Matilla, that original s uh, research coordinator for the sanctuary I've been working with on the East Coast, said, Ed, come help me here in Hawaii. I want to establish a response network. And I came. There are many benefits. Yes, there are challenges. But the water is clear and warm. Okay, it is, and if you're in the lee of an island, it's calm. You, yes, if you get in the channel, it's a different story, okay? Just don't, just avoid the channels, right? Put, put the tag on and wait, okay? Um, and I have to say, aloha spirit is big here. Um, the, that, back to that community, that on water community has been great. I know within a year or two of my working here, um, in the early days, we would have to ask the tour companies, can you please hold on to the whale? Yes, you've called it in, but don't. Do some, stay with it. We're going to lose it if you don't stay with it. Nowadays, or within a year or two, actually, I would go down to the boat when they made the call. I turned the VHF radio on, and nowadays, I hear them on the radio going, okay, I'm on the whale now. I can stay for 20 minutes, but I got another boat already lined up. To, I'm going to trade it off to them, and they, then so-and-so is going to get it after that. And I'm like, boy, does that put a... a shit-eating grin on my face. He's like, wow, that is so cool, you know, team effort kind of stuff. So, yep. So there's a lot going on there, a lot of pluses. And then how can people help otherwise? I mean, what I just mentioned is being a first responder, right? You know, calling in the report, standing by, getting, taking pictures from a safe and legal distance, you know, don't get hurt. Or anything. But then there's things like, you know, we just minimize what we put in the ocean. You know, we can all do that. You know, and if, and if we have to put in the ocean, things like fishing gear, if we want to eat crab, eat fish, um, make it as whale safe as we can. You know, there are, there are little tricks. Fishmen do not want to catch a whale, okay? They do not. So if, you, if we can figure it out with them, they have done little things to make their gear more whale safe. So things like that. It might be 5% here, 10% there. Increase awareness. So much of it is, is about that, the education, outreach, and, and stewardship and all that. And then there's that hotline. I wanted to make sure this is the NOAA Fisheries Regional hotline, this, I was telling folks earlier, this covers everything. Entangled whales, the monk seal, a turtle in distress, you get it. I know Maui Ocean Center tied into this with the turtle response, so there you go. Yep, so you can be safe, legal responders. There's a little course if you wanted to know more, if you wanted to send this to folks, there's a little online course we did for the entanglement response. Regionally, it's a 20-minute online course, how to be a first responder, you know. So there's that, and... Um, I just want a little wrap-up slide here. I think I'm, I'm doing okay. Um, what is a success as far as large whale entanglement response? I know I put disentanglement there, but I'd like to say entanglement response to denote that it's not all about cutting whales free, about getting the science as well. So potentially getting the lethal gear off the whale. N minimal harm to the animal, no harm to the team. We're going to keep the team safe, keep it going and gaining that information towards prevention. That's a big one again, kind of the ultimate goal there, reduce, mitigate, okay? And then lots of acknowledgments. I've been mentioning team throughout the night here, and I couldn't name everyone, but I can group them up a little bit, give you some examples. Uh, it is one great team effort. Really is truly that Aloha spirit here in Hawaii is strong, and I just, um, just really want to acknowledge that. So, and I think with that, I'm going to say thank you guys, mahalo, and, and questions. All righty. Can we get one more round of applause for Ed and all the wonderful work that he does?
I've seen this presentation s several times, actually, and I still am fascinated every time. I really think it's wonderful. Wonderful. Well, like Ed just mentioned, uh, we do have a little bit of time. We've allotted a little bit of time for some question and answer from the audience. This is your opportunity to ask questions that might be burning. Um, if you do have a question, go ahead and raise your hand. I just spotted a hand. We have our lovely staff from the Sphere that have a microphone. They're going to make their way over to the microphone with you when you have your question. Hi. I was wondering if after you saved a will, have you ever run across one that you that you knew you saved and they came back and maybe had new babies or, you know? Gotcha. Excellent question. Okay, now here's the back, little more background is the number of whales that are here. There, there are a lot here. Okay, when I was in New England, there was like 850 humpback whales in the Gulf of Maine. Here over 10,000 whales that might be here within a season or, or over seasons that come here in general. So the numbers work against us, but we have, I don't know if you guys have a little background here on humpback whale research. We, do, we don't tag them for the long term, so we don't put anything, because that would require shooting the tag into a whale to last long enough. What we do is a, a less invasive tag. It's the fluke ID. The underside of a whale's tail, differentially pigmented, is like a fingerprint. Between the differential pigmentation and the, the, the serrated edge is like a barcode, the trailing edge. And we take a we try to get a picture of our entangled whale, do our best, and then we send it to other researchers. And nowadays there's these digital catalogs. One of the big ones here that we work with is Happy Whale. They're based out of California, but they're Pacific wide. They're compiling, all the researchers are compiling all their fluke IDs in the Happy Whale. Actually have an app. I love this. On my phone, I have the, like a beta-tested Happy Whale app that I can put the photo into my phone and I can instantly maybe find out if like, um, someone has seen a whale that we've cut free. You get some, and so, by the way, they automatically send me those, by the way, Happy Whale, <laughs> so I don't have to ask my app to do it. But that is working, and we've gotten some recites of whales. Um, the first one we cut free has been recited many a time okay. here in Hawaii. Uh, we had a whale, um, that calf, that we made that surgical cut. We thought that one came, we thought we had that one recited. A couple years later, I don't know, it should have been an adult by then, or sexually mature. We ha had a little mark, like where I had made the cut. And I thought, oh, that's the whale, it's grew up. But it wasn't a match. So, so it, we had some matches, but not very many, because of those numbers. I have another question. There's been a lot of sightings on the northeast coast due to all the windmills that they put in the ocean there, and I'm wondering if they, if you or anybody is really paying attention to how these giant windmills, since they kill thousands of birds, if they're affecting the eco, uh, the messages of the whales and how they travel here and there, and so, you know, their eco, the way they you know, follow their trails? Another good question. I can answer that in part, because I'm going to stay within my specialty, okay, and that is on the entanglement side. So I have, in many cases, advised um, companies or regions as far as the entanglement threat goes with those turbines, with the, okay? Um, and, and in many cases, the, the anchoring devices are, are huge cables that are very tight, that we think pose very little entanglement risk. But when you get into the acoustics of a spinning turbine and, and are, is there issues there, I'm gonna probably let someone who has that background answer that question much better than I would, okay? So I'm gonna stick with my specialty there. Yes, hi. Um, how can we tell if a whale has become entangled? Is there a a certain behavior pattern or something like that because we're not allowed to get more than 100 yards, closer than 100 yards to them. I got pulled over last week by the Coast Guard because I was getting too close, but I was probably no, 80 yards or something like that, but I can't see much of what's going on. Another good question, and I don't remember what number slide it was, but it was the individual impact slide. I usually use that to give you, or answer that question, to give you the cues. Those cues are, well, the obvious one is if you see the whale and there's a buoy trailing behind it, right? There's the obvious ones. But that is not always the case. Buoys tend to get compromised. They, as the whale dives, they burst open, and that piece of plastic sinks and is trailing at depth. You don't see it. 
So you are right. There's many cases where the whale's entangled, and you don't see the, a line over the back. You don't see something trailing. What you're looking for then is something that's starting to compromise the animal. So you're looking for a whale that's thin, starting to look emaciated, more so than the normally they will get emaciated here just because they're not feeding much over time. So it's starting to get a little thinner. You look for a whale that's rough skinned. Look for a whale that's lighter in color, okay? They're kind of dark gray to black. You see one that's kind of light gray, typically there's something wrong. Um, look for one that has patches of different coloration on it. Uh, those are typically caused from the whale lice. Whales have these little crab-like animals. You might have seen a couple of them running across the back of mom on that suction cup uh, video. But they're normally found in whales, but not at large numbers. When a whale is compromised, like an entanglement, they overpopulate the whale. You'll see a bunch of, you'll see just herds of them, so to speak, crawling on the animal. So from a distance, 100 yards, you would see like patches of different color. And like the successional stages of like uh, trees repopulating a field, you know, uh, in your ecology books, it was the conifers came first, then the hardwoods. The light colored whale lice come first and then the red and orange species of whale lice come later. So with that information, your description or photos, we can tell whether the whale's compromised, maybe a hint of it, and maybe how far along as well, with my example of the whale lice there and different colors. A bit like measles and chicken pox or something. Yeah, things yeah. like that, yeah. yeah. So it's like we're, I like to make another analogy, and we're like whale doctors. And right. doctors initially use visual cues. When you walk in the door, or they walk in the door, and you're waiting there for them, they're looking at you. And they're, doing, they're, they're, check, you know, they're checking your eyes. They do, they do visual stuff first before they pull out all the instruments that might help them do more assessment. And that's what we do. We rely on visual assessment as much as we can um, to help us out. It's less invasive. Yeah. And yeah. about two months ago, there was a whale that was swimming around Maui with a broken back. Do you remember that one? Yep. Female. Um, moon. Yeah. Um, yep. She was probably on the way out, wasn't she? Probably not going to make it. We have, yeah. The last time she was seen that I'm aware of is December 9th. We actually we put a team on her off of Kona. I mean, in other words, they went out and, and did more visual assessment. They got photos, drone, put some pole cameras in the water. Um, in her case, the indication that we have is probably blunt force trauma from a vessel. Because uh, there was some, on her right side, she has two gout, healed gouges uh, on her right flank that look like old propeller marks. But I think it's the blunt force trauma of the boat hitting her that um, uh, injured the spinal cord. Spinal, would that be a sorry, large vertebral boat? column. Mm, would that and be a large boat? Yeah. Yeah. So would that be a large boat? Probably a large boat. Yeah. And that happened up in BC, uh, well, Cause didn't that it whale was go seen to... early in British Columbia yeah. with that injury. I'll, I'll put it that way. Mm. Yep. So it probably happened in the feeding grounds. Yeah. Yep. So um, that would also encourage uh, other sea creatures like per perhaps sharks or something because they smell death, right? Yep. Exactly. And that's probably going to increase the number of sharks that are swimming around, yep. which would also increase the likelihood of human beings being attacked as well, perhaps. It could, it could. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. then a lot of times I remember she was sighted off of um, Kihei, and I let authorities know that, you know, there was an injured whale off the coast, you know, and then it went off to Kona, like, the next day, you know, so. Right, yeah, thank you. And here has a question. I'm right here. I'm right here next to you. There we go. <laughs> what is the efficacy of the feedback loop on preventing the um, fishing gear so that they can improve it? Okay. Okay. Um, I would say most of that is, is fishermen just not, you know, there's an impact with them as well. And they do care. Most fishermen, do, I mean, I've had grown men crying over the fact that they've caught a whale. Okay, they do care. I mean, it's usually not to that degree. They don't, it, but it's also not only caring about the whale, but they don't want to lose their gear. It's a lot of money, or losing the catch, or losing the time of catch. Um, it's regulation. Uh, now, if you're fishing legally, uh, the fisherman individually does not get impacted, but the industry as a whole, the way the regulations work uh, in our system is if a certain fishery catches enough whales, then it changes their status. 
and they can have more regulations, more limitations because of that risk factor that the industry, that type of fishery is causing. So all, for all those reasons, they do not want that. But, and they, they, a lot of times, um, if you approach them the right way, not threaten them, they, they want to help. And they have helped me, that's for sure. And by the way, uh, out of all those whales that I've helped cut free, only once did a fisherman get in trouble. And it wasn't because he caught the whale. It was because he fished too early and the whale tattled on him. So he <laughs> snuck out and set his gear like at midnight and the opening wasn't until 8 o'clock. And that whale got caught during that night and was seen before 8 o'clock with his gear on it. So that's what he got in trouble for. He got, he got in trouble for fishing early because otherwise he was fishing legally. You know, so, yep. So we're not out to get fishermen is what I'm trying. I want to work with them. And they do, they have a lot of knowledge too and they are tweaking things. So they're trying. Besides the North Atlantic right whales and humpback whales, what other species have you had the opportunity to respond to? Uh, okay, other species, uh, some minke whales. A say, we had a say whale here in, in Hawaii once. Wow. Small, um, like a juvenile say whale. It was like 35 feet long, right in the Ao Ao Channel off of Lahaina. Um, but mostly here in, in Hawaii, it's been a lot of humpback whales. Um, back east, finbacks, minkies, humpbacks, right whales. Yeah, that's, I think that's it for me. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. Some, some little guys, dolphins, things like that, but they're different. Yeah, yep. Um, do you ever have people dive in the water to help uh, get the um, whales, like, untangled? We do, we do, because people care. This is that reference to people want to help the whale. And so when, if you're just the average public, someone on the water that sees an entangled whale, you look around and, and typically you don't, have, you don't have these tools, right? And so you do have maybe a, a, a mask, fins, a lot of um, helmless people, boat captains will carry that to clear their prop if they catch something, get run over some marine debris. So they have that tool, they have a knife. And so a lot of people will jump in the water and try to help the whale. And I will say this, it usually doesn't work out well for the whale. They usually, I mean, this, even an entangled whale is gonna outswim Phelps, okay? <laughs> the, you know, Olympic swimmer. It's amazing how fast they go, okay? So you're not gonna get really up to them very well. Even a sick entangled whale, um, you usually just get the trailing gear off. That's all that typically happens, if, if anything. And usually, they only got there to get that trailing gear because the whale's pretty far gone, by the way. Okay, and they cut the trailing gear off and they're leaving the lethal wraps behind. And in some ways, it's counterproductive because they cut the buoy off, they cut the gear off that you, we were using to find the animal. That, that was a cue. Now we have no cue. And I did admit to you guys already, the way we try to cut them free, we can, we can do cutting on the fly. That is really tricky to do. It has to, the whale has to let you motor next to it. You have to have a good captain on the boat to get you there and makes a cut. It's really tricky. So it can actually make things worse. It might mean that we won't be able to save the whale. Okay, that kind of thing. So, and people get hurt more. There's been many more cases. I know you'll go on YouTube or Facebook and you'll see some rescues, but I, can, I know that those are the few and far between and those are the ones that worked out and they get posted. But like a gambler, when you lose, you don't brag. You only <laughs> brag when you win. And that's what these rescues are, too. Only the ones that worked out do they get posted on Facebook. So, so it's kind of sad. People get hurt. People have been killed. So, so we, we're not allowed, by the way, good question, because we're, we're not allowed to get in the water. It's just, it's just too dangerous. So that's why all these tools, the knives, the poles, stay in the boat, reach out, cut them free. Good question. as the captains refer as zipper, because he has a scar, looks like a zipper on him. Yeah. Are you familiar with that whale? I don't know that whale, but in a sense, I know of many zippers, if that makes sense, meaning I see. And we, so one thing the sanctuary does, the humpback whale sanctuary, is we're, we do more than just cut whales free. We're trying to monitor the population. 
So with your help, with the All Water Community's help, or the, we go out and try to take pictures as well, I collect these images of these impacted whales to see how they're doing. And I've got many a whale in my little database that have those prop, you know, slice, slice, slice right on up um, that look like a zipper, you know. And those are ones that, you know, were shallow enough that, um, you know, I'll tell you a story. I, I love stories, if I may. Um, a couple years ago, someone came to the sanctuary and said, hey, I was out on a whale watch. I took these pictures the other day. Here they are. I want to give them to you. And it showed a female. So she had a calf, so I knew it was a female, with the prop scars, right? And so I was like, boy, I wonder if this is this season or if that's an old wound. So I, I sent it to all the experts, all the veterinarians, all the experts around. You know, I didn't want to just rely on my head. And most people came back to me and said, oh, that's... That's only a couple weeks old, only a month. So I said, okay, I'm going to log it as this season. I'm going to say this well got hit this season. One person about a couple weeks later came back to me, and he goes, Ed, I've been using that whale in my lectures for 10 years. He was a professional photographer, and so he showed me. He sent me a link to his catalog online, and I'm like, that's the whale. So it goes to show you how challenging it can be and how long these wounds can stay. I mean, 10 years. What was really embarrassing is I went back to our catalog and I found her <laughs> way back in our catalog. So we had taken a picture of her years ago. So, yep, yep. <laughs> All right, Does, oh, yep, um, can you bring a one down to him? We've got time for a couple more questions, so if anybody's got any any boiling questions, we'll do a couple so, more. Uh, <clears throat> I've been out there, and uh, I've been uh, sitting quietly, you know, with the motor off and everything, and up comes this calf with the mother, and the mother's just sitting there, not moving, the calf splitting about and everything else. And I thought of calling it in, but I didn't have a number. Now I have a number to call it in. But I just wonder if there was trouble for the mother um, and the um, she was just sitting there, whether the, the, the whale was resting or, you know, uh, she was waiting for the escort to come. And when the escort came right underneath my boat and then broached right in front of the boat, it was like, was that a warning? Is that a sort of like get out of here sort of thing? Okay, you a couple. Okay, a couple points there. Mother laying motionless at the surface. We get a lot of calls on that. Okay, especially shoreside calls. People in a condo looking out and seeing that, and wondering what's going on. In most cases, not all, but most, she is just resting. It's a smart mother. She's you know, two thousand miles, five weeks down here, a migration. She's got another 2,000 or plus five weeks to get back. She's nursing that calf, that 50% milk fat. You get the picture here. She gave birth to a one-ton calf, all that. She, a smart mother is going to rest, okay? So that behavior by itself is called logging a lot of times when they're doing it at the surface like that because from a distance it looks like a log floating at the surface. And if she's laying there but sinking once in a while, wetting her back, you know, keeping herself protected, probably okay. If, if there is something wrong with her, it, she might do the same behavior, but a lot of times they just, they're so out of it, they're injured, sick, diseased, whatever, that they won't wet their back and the back will start to blister. So that's back to our visual indicators. What might be going on? That's the kind of questions I might ask you if you called that in, okay? Now, the second part was the escort, okay? And a lot of times they are, they might uh, do, I call them flybys, you know? They, they chuff a little bit. They come by and the pecs will be out. They treat you like one of the guys. You know, if you've seen a comp group, you know, that female and all the males displaying, they'll do a bubble stream. They'll uh, put some water in their mouth or air in their mouth, make themselves look bigger. They're flexing their muscles. The pecs will be out to make them, you know, they'll put their pectoral flippers out. Um, and they'll do that to you. They might do that to you. And that's, that might be a, uh, an indicator that says, hey, you need to keep your distance. I'm here. Because that might be one of the roles of these escorts is to provide some protection. It's not going to be the father, so, but he might, he might have alternative investment there, but, uh, <laughs> but still. Wonderful. Thank you. And I love the subtlety there. 
<laughs> Wonderful. Well, it is 7.15. Thank you guys so much. I'm, I'm actually really proud that you guys were asking questions and filling up that whole time. Um, that will conclude our evening. Ed will be up here uh, with his items on the table. Can we get another round of applause for Ed? Thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate you guys taking the time. Uh, the Maui Ocean Center is aiming to host a sea talk uh, going forward once a month, so keep an eye out on your Eventbrite and our social pages. Um, and in addition to that, we, like I mentioned earlier, we did film uh, this, so make sure that if you're interested in looking back on some of this content or showing your friends and family some of the wonderful videos that Ed had to share with us today, uh, make sure you guys keep an eye out for that. And hopefully we'll see you guys around next month. Thank you guys so much, and mahalo. I just wanted to say if anybody is looking for tonight's presentation, it will be on the Maui Ocean Center's YouTube page uh, for replay. So that's how you can find it. <laughs>